True or false? Testosterone improves male fertility. If it's your own, yes. (laughs) If you decide that you want to hire testosterone and you want to go to the gym and get it, you just bought yourself a contraceptive. Family building is supposed to be easy, and it can be a shock when it's not. The roller coaster ride of infertility can be a mix of emotions and conflicting advice along the way. As a reproductive endocrinologist and former fertility patient myself, I not only help patients every day build families, but I remember what the ride was like for me. Hang on tight as we learn together from experts and share stories from infertility warriors. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen, and this is Baby or Bust. One in eight couples struggle with infertility in the United States, but you may not know how common male factor infertility can be. With most testing and procedures for infertility focused on women, we can easily forget about the men, but up to 30% of infertility involves male factor. Whether you know there is a male component to your infertility or you want to improve sperm counts and up the odds of conceiving sooner, there is a mix of information out there. On today's episode of Baby or Bust, we'll separate fact from fiction surrounding male factor infertility with male factor infertility specialist, Dr. Paul Turek, director of the Turek Clinics in Beverly Hills in San Francisco, California. Dr. Turek has dedicated his professional life to improving the fertility and health of reproductive age men. Dr. Turk, I am so excited to have you here today. You are a world leader in the field of male fertility. What is the single most important thing men can do to improve their fertility? I would say, what's the best they can do to optimize their fertility? So the answer to the question is good overall health. Treat your body like a temple. And that means all things in moderation, Everything. That is the single best thing you can do. And now it looks like your diet, your lifestyle, your weight, all the stuff that keeps you healthy matters enormously to sperm on every level. In general, a lot of times patients want to know, why do I have an abnormal sperm count? What are the kind of things that you are looking for and asking, you know, illnesses or medications? What kind of runs through your head when you see somebody with a low sperm count? So you start, when they ask why, you start with four things, a history, a physical, a semen analysis, and potentially blood work, because there can be causes in any of those four. If you ask me which of the four is the most important, it would be the history. So the history is it. So if there's a past pregnancy in his life, that tells me a lot. I think the physical exam is probably number two, and the semen analysis is number three. And so what does the evidence say about, say, nutrition? You know, are there certain diets that men should follow? I would say Mediterranean, keto, and paleo, nice choices. Nothing really in extreme, but you got to go back to what we, 100,000 years ago, what we were meant to eat. Got it. How about exercise? Is there too much exercise for men? Um, Is a sedentary lifestyle? Can you be too fit to be fertile? (laughs) And the answer is yes, and it was the best study ever done. So I often notice that Olympic athletes and you know, professional athletes and stuff work out so much their testosterones are low. And that is a just too much stress on the body. Remember, the body doesn't respond to stress with testosterone, it responds to cortisol. Think of being stressed in sports or Olympics as, you know, running from a woolly mammoth as a caveman. And which nervous system do you want to be active when you're running from a woolly mammoth? Not the rest and restore testosterone rich one. You want the cortisol rich run for your life nervous system, which is sympathetic. So, it's not good to be too active. So the study was beautiful. They took um, high-level athletes, and they did a trial where they put them on a high-intensity exercise regimen, and it was two hours a day at 80% maximum VIO2, so maximum capacity exercise for two hours a day, five days a week. Their testosterone levels fell by half. Their sperm counts fell by half from baseline. They then stopped that regimen and went back to their normal sort of moderate exercise regimen, that's extreme, and they went back up again. Okay. So it's not good, no, to be an extreme athlete. It's not good for fertility. How about the opposite end? How about obesity or a sedentary lifestyle? 
kind of bad too, right? Mm -hmm. There's enough studies from Europe and America that sperm concentrations are, you know, if you're mildly overweight, you're mildly have a problem. If you're more overweight, it's almost, it's dose dependent. Regarding any exercise, I just say, I think um, the data is if you sit for more than four hours a day, you're at higher risk for everything. This all goes back to your very first answer. You know, it all goes back to being healthy, you know? Right, making choices. Yep. And so you can think about it. Alcohol is a lot good? No. Coffee is a lot good? No. I mean, you'd have to drink 10, 12 cups a day to be toxic, but, you know, everything in moderation, except for things like pot, weed, edibles. None, please. Please, let's talk about that. We both practice in states where marijuana is legal. You're in California. I'm in Washington State. I get a lot of pushback from patients when I talk about the link between marijuana and infertility. Doctors do prescribe it. So therefore, you know, it's got to be healthy and natural. And so it's complicated. You're right. So the impression is because it's now federally approved, I think, mm. and, and in 25 states, that must be safe. But the problem with pot is so THC is the active ingredient, and it's been shown to slow motility. It hurts the DNA. It doesn't cause funny-looking kids, but it fragments the DNA. It hurts the motility, and the problem is it's worse than nicotine because it sticks around. It's fat-soluble and sticks around for a month. And everyone thinks that edibles are kinder than, say, flowers or pot, you know, smoking, toking it. But in fact, edibles are worse because you don't get the same high, so you don't stop. Mm. Right. So with with flowering, you, you take a lot, and then you and you realize it's affecting you, and you stop, and you get a spike. But with edibles, it's kind of a slope, so you tend to take more to get a similar effect. But less is more for that, for sure. Less is more. Yeah. And I, you know, now the associations between pot use and testis cancer are becoming very real. I wrote about them ten years ago when the first study suggested an association, but now there's a lot more confirming studies, all epidemiologic, showing that the rate of testis cancer is correlated with pot use, long-term pot use. What about other toxins? We hear a lot about endocrine disruptors, BPA, phthalates, parabens. We think about that a lot for egg health. BPA, these are stabilizers and plastics and things like that in your cans and your hot water bottles. And, you know, it's hard to prove, but I would say what's clear is that there are reproductive windows of development during development that are very fragile. So I think if you're doing BPA and all that stuff in, as a woman, if you're exposed to even nicotine and stuff at that point, the future fertility of the fetus is at risk. I do believe that. But I don't know if an adult male exposed to BPA is going to have a problem. Yeah. 87,000 chemicals in the environment, very few, a handful, maybe 11, we know the reproductive toxicology of. But we don't, it's hard to study. So we have talked about health as the number one thing to help improve fertility in men. Talked about nutrition, exercise, you know, some toxins that are bad for sperm health. Tobacco, you mentioned, alcohol, marijuana, everything in moderation. If you're doing something that is not healthy and you change that, that's the best way to improve your fertility or optimize it. Because I, I use the word optimize because I think you, it wants to run there. And improving sounds like you're a B and you want an A and you have to work harder to get it. But it wants to be an A and you're keeping it down as a B. So you're responsible for this. Diet, weight, and exercise are the easiest ones. But stress is a big one. Yeah, let's talk about stress. It's hard to measure it. And stress can be anything. We're talking travel, financial, emotional, COVID, anything. I mean, I see testosterone levels that during the recession in 2008, during the dot-com bust in 2000, and during COVID that are the lowest, you can't imagine how low they can go just from sheer physical or emotional stress. Control what you can. Exercise, acupuncture, massage, and you know yoga. Get, get your body tired and, and that'll reduce your stress. So really the wrong response is alcohol at five o'clock. Yeah. But the right response is take care of your body. It's all you can do. It's all you can do. Your relationship and your body, you can't control anything else. Good luck, right, with everything else. And the people who realize that early on, empowered. They get it. They're like, I need to take care of myself. Yeah. I need to take care of my family, myself, and we all have to take care of ourselves because Absolutely. there's nothing else you can do. Yeah. 
Um, patients ask me all the time if there are any supplements that they can take to improve their sperm count. Do you have any research on that or recommendations? About 10 years ago, the Cochrane Review came out with a meta-analysis of maybe 20 trials of antioxidant supplements in men. And they found that men who took something like an antioxidant supplement, those women got pregnant more often and miscarried less. And it was like two to three fold. It was a pretty big difference. You know, it balances out the nutritional deficiencies. It probably doesn't improve your sperm count. I think it improves your sperm motility a lot, and I think it improves sperm health. You know, again, big picture, health is important. Supplements can't totally make up for your diet or what you're putting in your body. Antioxidants are good. Uh, One of them can be CoQ10, and it's very important, and I'm hearing you loud and clear, it's very important which supplement you choose um, and be very careful because they're not all created equally. So, and the other one is, you know, hot baths. I did a study where I pulled men out of hot baths in Northern California. All of them are environmental lawyers. I don't know why they use hot tubs so much, but put them out and their sperm counts went up, sperm total, sperm quality, 600% improvement in six months, 400% improvement in four months. Some of them were zero and they went and went to normal. It is very powerful stuff. Yeah. You're, you're basically a liquid. You go hot, it's going to go hot. Saunas, we now know, are about half as bad. Okay. But it looked like in terms of relative potency of heat, the hot baths or tubs are number one. Saunas and heated seats are probably number two. And other things like underwear probably don't matter much. You know, women are flocking to freeze their eggs and hold on to fertility because it's very well known that as women age and their eggs age, fewer of them are able to um, be successful and fertility does change. But what about for men? Is there an age impact for men? Absolutely. Yep. There's a biological clock for men as well as women. It's a little bit different timeline. And they stopped making sperm at menopause, which is probably in the 70s. As they age, the sperm-making machinery is getting tired. Sperm are made every three months, and the machinery, the quality control goes down. More importantly, there's a paternal age effect on the genetics. Older men tend to have higher miscarriage rates, higher near-term birth deaths, higher um, birth defect rates around twofold, and most impressively, higher psychiatric morbidity which includes autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disease, dyslexia. So these are neural developmental disorders that the adult offspring can have, as well as the young offspring. Fortunately, it's a hockey stick curve, so it's slowly rising risk. And then it goes up like a hockey stick, the end goes way up. And that usually is around age 60 or 65, and it goes way up after that. Okay. So should men be freezing their sperm like women are freezing their eggs? If you're 60 or 65 and don't have a kid, I'd say, you know, probably too late. If you're 40, you know, you're looking at risky behavior for 10 years and then, you know, something like that, then yeah, that might be worth it. Difference between 20 and 40 is probably not that much. 40 and 60, maybe a little more, but 60 to 70 would be a lot. If you're unsure, then yeah, but it's not a guarantee of anything, right? Absolutely. Dr. Turek, we all want to know what is the single biggest myth out there regarding male fertility? The single biggest myth is that men don't matter and that it's all female. But that is the problem. And it's a complicated one, right? Because men don't want it to be part of the problem. They don't admit to be part of the problem and they can't imagine they are. So it's partly male driven, but it's also cultural because women are take the initiative. Single men live five to seven years less long than coupled men. And the reason is because the partner takes, it's mainly heterosexual, but even in gay couples, or lesbian couples, it's still it's still the issue. So men, men are partners live longer because someone else takes care of them. They don't take care of themselves. <laughs> and that's, that's the issue. So the six-year difference in lifespan between coupled men and single men is just stunning. That's like mm-hmm. a cancer diagnosis or something, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's just wrong. Right. If you're very infertile, very low sperm counts or zero, you're at higher risk for things later in life. The first manifestation of that problem is the problem with fertility because you don't make sperm or you don't make good sperm. So that, that was the biomarker concept. 
fertility is a biomarker of health. It took fertility out of the realm of being a moon around the globe or the world of health and put it right smack into the ocean of it. How do you talk to people about how important it is to think about the men when the couple is having trouble conceiving? Well, this is a sad statement, but, um, you know, our national guidelines and societies recommend that if a couple's having trouble conceiving, they both get evaluated. Okay, they both get evaluated. And so women always get evaluated. And that can cost some money, right? Um, But men don't. And so that's an interesting thing. So in North America, Canada, and, and and America, USA, one out of five men who are going to IVF have been evaluated for their fertility potential by a, by a specialist or an expert. Everyone gets a sperm count before they go to IVF, but nobody gets the care. Yeah. When do you recommend that men should see a specialist like you? As soon as they have a problem. Even if the semen analysis is nice and normal? Absolutely. Same time. If the semen analysis is normal, it doesn't mean they're not going to have a problem with fertility. 25% of unexplained infertility is male. Fertility, every couple that is having difficulty conceiving, uh, the male partner should see a male fertility specialist. Yes, that's the rule. Let's get into some more myths. Let's bust some myths. Testosterone will improve male fertility. If it's your own, yes. (laughs) If you decide that you want to hire testosterone and you want to go to the gym and get it, you just bought yourself a contraceptive because the only testosterone that's going to help you out is your own. And there are only a couple of ways to do that. And you want to say, well, what's bioidentical testosterone? And that, that's nothing, but the real bioidentical is yours. So if you can raise your testosterone levels through healthy living, good diet, exercise, weight loss, because just being overweight lowers your testosterone, then you're doing yourself a favor and that's the way to go. So the classic is obesity. And what happens in fat is testosterone goes to the fat and gets converted to female hormone estradiol. And that goes to the brain and says, you know, we got plenty of female hormone here, no more testosterone, because that's how we get it. So lower it, please. And then your testosterone goes down, and that's probably the mechanism for the infertility. So, you know, it's just, it's really clear, but you can't add testosterone to your system exogenously from the outside world and keep fertile. It's, it's pretty much a contraceptive. It's being studied that way right now. I hear you loud and clear, but I have had patients come to me and other physicians have put them on testosterone because they had a low sperm count. It just sort of logically makes sense that testosterone should improve sperm count. So why does that not work? Right. Good one. So it's called negative feedback. Your system regulates itself by the levels. So if you make testosterone, it goes back to the brain, the brain sees it and says, okay, we're a little low, I'm going to need a little more. So it turns more gas to the testicle to tell it to work harder. It's constantly maintained on, by the hour. Now, if you add a bunch of testosterone to the system from a shot, it's going to go to the brain. The brain's going to say, well, plenty of tea here, turn off. And those signals are essential for making sperm. And so you will either go very low or zero until you stop. And then there is a point, and I see these men all the time, where if you take enough testosterone for, say, longevity, you can fry the testicle and will never recover. Your testicle probably won't come back. Because when you shut organs in the body off, glands off long enough, they don't recover. Yeah. Yes, testosterone is good for lots of things. But in excess, it's not good for much. Yeah. It's certainly not good for fertility. Okay, next myth. Age does not impact fertility because, you know, Mick Jagger had his eighth (laughs) child at 73. And I looked this up. The oldest that I can find on a Google search is Les Colley in Australia had his ninth child at 92 in Australia. Wow. So So it's possible. Men can, right? So age affects women, of course, but it doesn't affect men, right? Men can have babies at any age, right? Well, I mean, Mick Jagger does look great. I mean, he, <laughs> you know, I, I heard him at a concert, you know, in LA and was like, wow, I mean, he is just, he's an anomaly. He looks <laughs> yeah. really good. So there is a biological timeline for men. And then there's a clock for men. It's usually around the seventh or eighth decade. They'll stop making sperm because they have a menopause, not a menopause, but a menopause. The fertility of their sperm is probably lower because of DNA fragmentation rates being higher. If that's all in good shape, then their fertility can be very high. All right, next myth. If a man has caused a pregnancy in the past, you know, 
uh, then he's always fertile. Like he, you know, he doesn't need to do a semen analysis if he's having trouble conceiving now because he's had a baby in the past or caused a pregnancy in the past. It doesn't mean if you have paternity that you're normal. And a lot of them I see same couples, first pregnancy goes quickly, second one, sperm counts a million, you know, it should be 15 million, it's a million. And he's got a high FSH and I realized that he has testicular failure and they got lucky on the first one. And now it's different. It's got a different problem. Okay, next myth, boxers versus briefs. Whatever you want. No, that's a real concern for some people. I'd say the data is uneven and not convincing for either way. I'd also say that if briefs were a problem, we'd be infertile as a species. You know, the scrotum does a very good job of regulating its temperature. It's so good at that. That's its job. Is biking okay? And if so, is there too much biking? The whole event came from, well, two things, came from erection, erectile dysfunction associated with biking, which is due to a nerve or arterial damage from the seat. So if you get a pelvic if you get pelvic numbness on a bicycle, get rid of the seat and get one tailored to your body so it works better. But biking is good for you. But the seats, if they're causing numbness, are not. That's an established cause of erectile dysfunction. So that was like the warning sign. And then a study came out of Spanish professional cyclists. And they had low sperm counts and poor morphology. And they were surprised because they're so healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I looked at the paper and I said, Spanish competitive cyclists, they're on steroids. They're doing this, they're doing that. <laughs> yes, they're healthy. They're incredibly healthy, but you know, Lance Armstrong, right? I right. mean, I love the guy, but Oh my wow. gosh, you are so right. I did not put that, but it's exactly what we were talking about. You know, again, so a couple things, extreme athleticism is not good for fertility, it's just too much cortisol and too much catabolism. It's not a testosterone, you know, centered world. Your body is not evolutionary thinking about fertility at that point. How about commuting British cyclists? The average person in Britain, there's 5,000 people that they studied that were cycling to work every day. Much more reasonable population like you and me. They didn't look at semen analysis. They looked at their fertility and it was way above the national average. You know, if you're not getting numb, and you're not doing extreme cycling uh, like the professionals are, then don't worry about it and enjoy the stress reduction you get from it. Okay, hot tubs. <laughs> Terrible for you. Okay, this, Terrible. this is good to know. Yeah, that's a, that's a myth that's not a myth. You know, I did a paper where we pulled men out of hot baths, watched their sperm counts go up 400%. Wow. Over three months, 600% over six months. Some were zero, went to normal. 102 degrees for 10 to 20 minutes, three times a week, will probably make you zero. Drop you to zero, normal normal. otherwise, drop you to zero. So you can imagine a flu or COVID, if with a high fever for a couple of days, same thing, you're probably gonna lose your sperm count and it'll come back. So will, will a single bath do something? Probably not. You know, it's just gonna stop the process for an hour or two and then it'll continue. So you probably won't see much, but if you do it a couple of times a week for a month or two, Yeah, it could be seriously Mm -hmm. impacted. Okay. I'm glad you brought up COVID. I have seen a little bit in the literature about COVID and sperm counts and male fertility, but can you tell me what your takeaway is, what you're telling your patients? So COVID uh, is a flu, basically. So its mechanism of male fertility would be the same as a flu. You get high fevers and you get really ill and you lose a lot of weight, you're going to have a problem with sperm production because your body is not prioritizing that anymore and that you should recover from fully. So that's a classic flu. So sex is not a way to contract COVID. I think about mumps, like that virus, if you do contract it, it can have a big impact on male fertility. Right. So the last issue is, is there a viral mechanism to make you infertile like mumps? So mumps is one of maybe one or two viruses that it's not a flu virus, but it's you know, it's, it's viral and could it drop and go to your testicles and do something like mumps can. I have one case of a guy who had COVID whose sperm count fell and I'm, we're, I think about it and he's recovered and I think about it, but I think that's the flu effect, not a COVID specific effect. So right now there's no real evidence to panic about a COVID specific effect on male fertility like mumps. 
Although we can see that some men will have a temporary lower sperm count as they're recovering from a COVID infection, it seems to act like the flu in that they'll eventually recover. I get a lot of questions and there's a lot of myths surrounding fertility and sperm production after vasectomy. Can you talk a little bit about if someone comes to you with a vasectomy, what options are available to them to add to their family or have a baby if they've had a vasectomy? Yeah. So basically there's two options for your own kids after vasectomy. You can either reverse it or not. And if you don't reverse it, you can tap the system like a spigot and get sperm out. And so reversal is, you know, two to three hours under a light general anesthetic. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than a vasectomy. It costs more than a vasectomy. It's microsurgery. They're so reversible, it's silly. So 15 years out from your vasectomy, we're in the high 90s for getting sperm counts back. 40 years out, we're in the 80s. 40-year-old vasectomy. The question is, is fertility the same? You're allergic to your sperm, and you form antibodies like you would a vaccine. So that vaccination happens at the time of the vasectomy, but it reactivates at the time of reversal. So there's always antibodies around binding to sperm, and that could either slow them down or get them killed. I think it's just a matter of time. I think what reversal does, it it lengthens the time to pregnancy because of the antibodies. It takes longer. That's great. And what if what if guys are hesitant to get a reversal? You said there's two options. Yeah. So the men love the, the vasectomies. And I had a guy from Alaska who had, they used vasectomy like a condom. I mean, they had kids, vasectomy, reversal, kids, vasectomy, and they wanted a third kid. And they came to me from Canada. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, it's his fifth <laughs> procedure, what's left. And wow. I got him back. I mean, we did it. So it was That's pretty amazing. Incredible. So, so men don't even know that. But yeah, get another vasectomy. It's an office visit. It's eight minutes or 12 minutes instead of eight minutes. And then the other is to just tap the system. Now, that is different. So you keep your vasectomy. Men love that. But, and it's a lot smaller of a procedure. It could be done under local anesthesia. Um, but the sperm you get is not ejaculated. So it's still immature. It's still being, it's made and it's genetically okay, but it's not, for instance, it doesn't know how to smell follicular fluid and know where to go. And its motility is kind of not as weak. So, you know, it's like a baby trying to conceive versus an adult trying to conceive. Everything's kind of there, but not working well. So that requires IVF. So the other end of it is you need a lot of help with the sperm and that's, test tube baby with single sperm injection, it goes all the way to the highest levels of putting the sperm and the egg in a dish. And so that changes the emphasis entirely. Yeah. Right? So it goes from a simple procedure for the guy to something quite much more complex for the woman. So when I have this discussion, I don't tell people what to do. My average female age in San Francisco is 38 and a half, LA 39, New York 40. And I'm like, I, I just give them the data and say, this is what we can do. Right. And you have to decide because there's a couple of timelines going on. You know, one is how much time does she have biologically? Because men, it really doesn't matter that much. And the second is when does she want the baby, right? Right. And the big picture, because you know, I'm counseling the couple on the other end, and you think about okay, well, how many kids yeah, do you want? Right, that too. You know, and how and so you know, think about your strategy and your family goals too with that discussion. So I never tell women what to do because of that. They make the best decisions when they're well-educated. <laughs> so I had 42-year-old women sitting in the office. Husband's vasectomy is five years old. I said, the chance he's going to have sperm back is 99%. It's probably 75% of the time they'll get it back within three months. Okay. And that means they'll be able to conceive after two or three months or even faster. But if they're healthy at any age, it's always more cost-effective to do the reversal as opposed to IVF. The other issue is twin triplet rate, so multiples. So sex is 1% to 2%. IVF is 30 to 40. It's getting better, but it's still high. The guys just, they just go pale when you say that. Oh, right? for sure. <laughs> They're like, no. <laughs> you know, I focus on female fertility. You focus on male fertility. And it really does take a balanced approach and look at the couple together. And the, the team approach to care is the right way. Yeah. So time to pregnancy is a massive issue in my practice. But they make beautiful decisions. With the right information, hmm. they nail it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And that, what a wonderful way to round out this conversation because you really are absolutely helping people, not only the patients that are in your office, but all the people that you reach through the education and lectures and your incredible blog that just really breaks down complex questions with data. So thank you. I very much appreciate your time. It's great being here, Laura. Thanks for joining us today on the Baby or Bus podcast. I really enjoyed reconnecting with my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Turek. He helped us all remember just how much men matter on this fertility journey. You can learn more from Dr. Turek at his website, turekclinics.com. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Dr. Laura Shaheen, and this is Baby or Bust. If you like this episode, let us know. Give us a five-star review and follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Baby or Bust is produced by Mark Ramsey, Jamie Solis, and Greg Moga. Executive produced by Paul Anderson, Nick Pinella, and Andrew Greenwood for Workhouse Media. Baby or Bust is a Mark Ramsey media production. Thank you.